Welcome back to my channel. We're continuing talking today and wrapping up talking for this particular mini-series about arguments from silence against testimony in history. I'm going to call this one the chances and changes of this mortal life. That's a phrase from the Book of Common Prayer. The chances and changes of this mortal life affect the legitimacy of the argument from silence. This is something that my husband Tim mentions in the article that I'm going to be linking on the argument from silence. The question arises when we're talking about history, whether some other hypothetical report, if in fact it really existed, would make it to us. This is particularly relevant with respect to the first century AD and in, even in general ancient events because, you know, the longer the time period, the more uh, possibilities there are for a document to be lost. Uh, papyrus could decay. That's why the Dead Sea Scrolls were such a big finding, you know, because they were sealed in, this, in these jars and so forth. And even so, they had to be really careful, you know, when they unrolled them and, and so forth. So for the document to survive, part of the reason that the Gospels themselves have survived to us, so we have so many manuscripts of them, is because they were original sources believed to go back to the apostles and their companions. They were stories of Jesus' life, and therefore they were considered authoritative by the Christians, so they copied them over and over and over again um, in, in scroll form, in codex form, uh, which is like what we would call a book, and so forth. But uh, often you will hear a, a skeptical statement like, why don't we have some report outside the Gospels of fill in the blank? So the, the darkness at Jesus' crucifixion is an example. I also think skeptics tend to overread that phrase, you know, over all the land, as if that means, you know, everybody from, I don't know, Damascus to Alexandria or something, you know, uh, could see it, uh, you know, this huge geographical claim as opposed to being a, a phrase that people who were there would have difficulty knowing exactly how far this spread. What they knew is that, you know, it was certainly all across Jerusalem and its environment, it, it was dark. But the Christian authors were motivated to write that down and then the Christians to keep copying the reports because it concerned Jesus and his death. Um, but even if it were mentioned in some document outside of the Gospels, would we have that document? Very plausible that we would not. If you take all of the books and, and have them in book form from the first century that survive, it's going to fill maybe one shelf, maybe a foot and a half, uh, maybe a foot and a half long, something like that even if you include, you know, the works of Josephus and so forth. And that is not just historical documents. That includes, like, agricultural treatise, uh, a, you know, play by Petronius. Um, so all kinds of things that aren't even historical. Because a lot of stuff just didn't survive. That's really, really important to keep in mind. So this is, again, a calibration. We're not just saying something like, well, gee, our senses must be unreliable, but it's rather taking into account the kinds of ways that we know that a confident prediction, like some non-Christian author would record and we would have his record of the darkness at Jesus' crucifixion if it really happened, could go wrong and could very plausibly go wrong because of actual empirical facts that we know about ancient documents and our distance in time from them and the chances and changes of this mortal life. So with all of this in mind, from not just what I just said here, but the other two videos as well, I'd like to revisit an analogy about your brother winning the lottery, which I mentioned in the first. So as I've mentioned before, this little mini series is occasioned by some comments on social media uh, by a philosopher named Dustin Crummett saying that, um, 
you know, the, the Magrupi response to arguments from silence against the Gospels, arguments from silence against reports in biblical criticism, um, would be like saying that we can't be confident that my brother didn't win the lottery uh, because he didn't tell me, when in fact your brother probably would tell you if he won the lottery. You're in touch with your brother a lot. You and your brother are close, etc. cetera. Um, you could have a pretty high probability that if your brother won the lottery, he would tell you. Now, as I mentioned, uh, even in the very first video, that should be defeasible as well. That shouldn't be something that just swamps every other evidence you might get that your brother won the lottery. Um, but I think we should modify this for, for ancient documents, ancient texts, and the randomness of saliency of interest that I discussed last time, uh, the chances and changes of this mortal life. So with that, a different analogy about your brother and the lottery. There is a lottery in the 1800s, in the early 1800s. You live in Boston. Your brother lives on a homestead way out west. Um, but there, there was this lottery. It took place in the east. Your brother's closest town does not even have a telegraph office. You do get letters, you're not estranged. You get letters from your brother three or four times a year. These letters uh, have to be written with a an ink pen, a pen actually dipped in ink and scratched out on fairly scarce paper. There is no office supply store to which your brother can go regularly and just get huge reams of paper for writing letters. He's got other things to spend his money on and uh, Paper is not just everywhere. You know, I got more paper than I know what to do with in this house. If I needed to write letters on paper, I could do it just on the backs of things I print out like this. But this situation, it's not like that. And they have to be written by daylight, lamplight, or candlelight. Um, the letters come to you by stagecoach. The journey takes a long time. The stagecoach is sometimes robbed and letters are lost when that happens. They just end up somewhere out in the, out in the desert, you know, uh, never found. Or a horse can break a leg. In the winter, letters are sometimes lost due to snow when uh, the coach is uh, toppled over or something in the snow or gets stuck or something like that. And this, these last points also apply to the means by which your brother himself would learn in the first place that he won the lottery. Or if you want to make it, came into a legacy from a distant aunt living in Boston. Um, so, so that information has to travel out to him by these slow and uncertain routes uh, subject to the chances and changes of this mortal life. Now, you did get a letter from your brother fairly recently, and there's a date on it. That date is such that in principle, it would have been possible for him to have received word if he had really won that particular lottery. Um, but even if he won, the notification or message might not have made it to him yet uh, by, by the time he wrote that letter, but, but it's possible that it would have. So this is, the, the, the first letter that you're looking at and you're wondering if he's going to report that he won the lottery. Let's say that, you know, uh, you don't have any other way to find it out. The lottery winner is a secret. So the word has to go out to your brother and come back to you uh, before you find out. All right. Now, now let's talk about the random of salient, randomness of saliency in reportage. In the letter that you did receive, the letter in question, your brother tells about the following. His wife almost died giving birth to twins. Uh, there's been a typhoid epidemic in his local region. One of his children got very sick and this ch child who got very sick was uh, his oldest daughter who would normally be helping with the twins, taking care of them uh, now that the twins have been born and his wife is still very weak from this very difficult childbirth. Uh, and he, he tells you all of this. Uh, he also mentions things about 
running the homestead and taking care of the animals. He's got a, a busy life. He only has time to uh, write letters if he stays up after his work is done, you know, writing by lamplight, but sometimes he's just too tired to do that. So he, that's going to affect the, the length of the letters and how much he includes. He gives you all of this news that is obviously very important personally to him, and then he signs off. You know, must stop now, your brother, Jared. Uh, and you know that his signing off might be influenced by when he's going to go to town and post a letter. You know, it's not like there's just a mailbox on the corner where he just walks out and drops the letter in. You then hear from your sister that he did write a letter to her recently. And in that letter, he mentioned to her that he won the lottery. Even before you see the letter that your sister received, and you can, you know, check the handwriting or whatever, but even before that, should you doubt your sister's word? Should you put a big, you know, big question mark over it? Um, really? Really, Sarah? You know, Jared won the lottery. I just got a letter from him and it was dated such and such, you know, well after that lottery when he could have heard, he doesn't say anything about it. I don't know, you know, and she's like, no, I couldn't have misunderstood, you know, he, he said this and this and this, and she summarizes what he said. I submit that due to all of the above cited factors, you should not doubt your sister's word. You should remember how your brother's time is constrained, how he might have signed off quickly uh, in order to get the letter off to you, how it's entirely plausible that he hadn't yet heard that he had won the lottery and that the, the uh, information came in between the letter that he wrote to you, or that he may have written to you separately and that letter may have been lost. So many possibilities that you should not put a super high probability above, you know, some really high cutoff. No, it's like very, very prob probable that in this letter, Jared would have mentioned to me if he had won the lottery. And then that very high probability causes you to say, uh, he didn't mention it. Therefore, it's very probable that he didn't win the lottery. Therefore, I'm, I'm going to at least have a lot of doubt about my sister's claim that she's received word that he did win the lottery. I don't think you should do that. And that kind of calibration is a lot more like the ancient history or even, uh, you know, 17 and 1800, you know, even something a few hundred years ago that we have, but all the more so for ancient history, the calibration that we should be doing before we go out and make these extremely confident statements it would be in this document if it were true. So I hope this has been useful and maybe even a little bit of fun uh, for you, thinking about ancient history and arguments from silence. Come back next time to the Lydia McGrew channel where we're making common sense rigorous.